and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. Glad you're with us today. This is a very interesting time of year for us because it is so busy. Uh, originally we had Dice Tower Cruise which was scheduled for February but someone bought out the whole ship and forced us to move to January which is great except hey it's now and there's a lot of stuff to get ready. Dice Tower Cruise is going out this week. So that's keeping me a little bit busy and because of that I have to go do some prep for that today, so I won't be doing a live Q&A. Instead, Sam and Z will be doing our live Q&A at 10 o'clock this morning, so make sure you go in there and ask them some hard questions for me. Also, two weeks from today, on the 21st of January, we're gonna be launching our annual Dice Tower Kickstarter. Uh, our Kickstarter is a way that we raise money for the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is a free thing. All our videos are free. You can watch them to your heart's content. We put out thousands of videos and our audio podcast and lots of different things. And if you think that that's worth your time, if you think we've done something good and helpful to you, then we ask that you consider contributing to the Dice Tower. So think about that. Two weeks, it's coming. We have some really neat gifts and things for people who do back the Dice Tower. We just want to put out a big public thank you to everyone who backed it in 2018. And we'll be talking more about that in two weeks, so stay tuned. You'll be able to find that just by going to our website, dicetower.com, and I'll have also more details for that in the board game breakfast that comes out two weeks from now. All right, so with that being said though, let's get started with today's episode. We have a lot to go through, and as always, we'll start with the news. All right, first of all, Obviously, Wingspan is being able to be pre-ordered at this point in time. I think it's coming out in a couple months. This new Stonemaier game, if you haven't heard about it, from the six million reviews, I did a review of it myself. I really do think it's going to be one of the hottest games of the year. It's I really enjoyed it myself. We'll see how it goes, but a Stonemaier game is usually some sort of event, and this one looks to be that way. Funforge has announced quite a few things. Uh, I've already talked uh, just last week. I did my top 10 kids games of 2018. One of them was Magic Maze uh, for kids. Now they have an XXL mat, a really big mat. I know the release is at Essen, because I have one, um, but the, this will be available for everybody. And speaking of Magic Maze, that cooperative game where you can't talk, a new expansion, Hidden Rolls, is coming out with the possibility of there being a traitor, as if the game didn't have enough stress in it. But there you go. And then Gravity Superstars. And this is kind of a fascinating game as I read about this one. It's a platformer type game, right? You know, the 2D platformer, you jump, 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 jump. And that's what this game is. From what I can understand from reading it, you like lay your pawn down and it's like you're moving and then jumping and then gravity will pull you down. I don't know, but it sounds cool based on a video game. Speaking of video games, Shinobi 7 is doing Sonic Battle Racers. Now this one sounds more like a bit of a cash grab. You're running around collecting rings. I looked at it. I'm not drawn in by the picture of the game and I, that, that they're the boss uh, is added as an expansion. Who knows? But I'm willing to give it a whirl because I like Sonic, but we'll have to wait and see. Simon is no longer exclusive. Uh, they have just announced that they're going to be working with all five of the major distributors. So it was a while ago, maybe a year or two, that Simon had announced that they were going to be exclusive. Uh, with one distributor, now they work with all of them. I'm a fan of this kind of news because I, I'm not a huge fan of exclusivity. There's definitely benefits in it for both the publisher and the distributor. Not as much for stores. If you call you know, the distributor and say, hey, I want you know, so many copies of this game, and they say, we don't have it, you can try another distributor. But if it's only at one, well, there you have it. You know, you have, you're stuck going to that one distributor. Um, you know, like I said, there's good things, but I think overall this is a good move. Capstone has announced Magna Storm. So this is an interesting game. Uh, looking, I think I saw this one at PAX Unplugged. It's hard to tell, I don't remember which games I saw. I know when I go by Capstone Booth, I'm always like, ooh, everything there looks pretty cool. But this one here is, uh, has actions, it's like a sci-fi universe, but what fascinates me about the description of this one is when a game is over, each player gets one of 120 reward cards that you then can use in the next game. And I guess it scales if you win or lose. But this is not a legacy game, and it's not a campaign game. It's like just a card that directly affects the next game. 
And that's interesting, right? Because you want to play again right away. It just sounds like a new concept, which I'm okay with. I want to see how it works. So Age of Steam has been announced from Eagle Griffin Games, the deluxe version, which would not be hard. You simply have to make it look slightly nicer than before for it to be a deluxe. It was a pretty bland looking game. Age of Steam is a very controversial game. Over a decade ago, uh, the designer of the game, Martin Wallace, and the developer, first publisher of the game, John Bauer, had a pretty public tiff on the internet about this, uh, which led to Martin Wallace being so upset that he gave up the game, went and basically designed almost the same game called Steam for Mayfair Games at the time. Uh, John Bauer took the game and gave it to Eagle Griffin, who then published it at that point. And then there was you know, more stuff going on. The two games are both still out there somewhere. And then Railroad Tycoon was another one. Um, so this a new Age of Steam just has John Bauer's name on it. Doesn't have Martin Wallace at all anymore. So take that as well as an unfortunate thing, especially the fact that it was so public. But it, all that information is on the internet. Z-Man has announced Not the Luca. This game looks pretty cool. It's by Shem Phillips. Uh, who is the designer of Raiders of the North Sea and Architects of the West Kingdom. This one's an abstract game, and you're going to be collecting dice from a pool and then using them to fill potions. It looks really pretty. Weird name. Uh, but it's more of an abstract game, so I'm, I'm very interested based on the designer and also Z-Man. I like them. And then finally, and sad news, Darwin Bromley has passed away. Darwin was one of the co-founders of Mayfair Games, which that company was absorbed and kind of passed away itself last year, but he had uh, left the company years before that. He started this company way back in the day. Mayfair is a very important company in the history of board gaming, uh, bringing Catan over and other games and basically helping start a game revolution in the United States of America. Uh, Darwin is also one of the co-designers of Empire Builder, which started its whole genre, essentially, of the Cran Rail games. He was also an avid collector of games, collected quite a few games, and donated, him and his brother donated many of these, to a board game library. So that's a pretty neat thing, and uh, we're very thankful for all that he has done for the hobby, and our condolences are with his family now, and we appreciate everything Darwin. All right, so with that being said, let's move on to Kickstarter news. Hello fellow gamers, I hope everybody had a wonderful new year. I know I spent my new year going through my shelf of shame, becoming a hermit, and definitely avoiding house cleaning. But I did have time to look through the barren land of Kickstarters just for you guys, so let's get started. Featured this week we have Yaws, which is a handcrafted game for one to four adventurers looking to cooperatively search the land of Yaws to collect gems, Unlock hidden treasures beneath the castle all before the cunning thief does. By using a deck of movement cards, fighting dragons, and exploring an ever-changing landscape. As this has a modular card system that acts as a board. However, keep in mind this is a handcrafted beauty for $89. And be aware that they did make a less expensive alternative for $36. Now, if you suddenly stop when you hear the word cooperative and have a yearning to be a pretty, pretty princess adorned with jewels, then the Lost Island is just for you. As one to five treasure hunters search this modular board looking to pillage the land, fight other players, and craft jewelry for about 60 minutes. In this roll and move game that will challenge players to complete all of their objectives first, and plunder their way to victory. A pledge for this game costs $35 and the heart of a ruthless dragon, but I'm not judging anyone here. Speaking of ruthless chicks, we have plenty of those in Chicken Time Warp. As three to six chicken scientists are trying to escape the time vortex they created and make it back to the badly engineered one-seated escape pod before anyone else. Players will use their cards to peek, steal, and swap looking for that pod for about 30 minutes. But if you can't avoid your chicken's earthly demise before the escape window, then hopefully you can play a Clux Capacitor card, rewinding time and reversing the death of yourself as well as your few closest friends on the timeline. This timey-wimey game will cost you $18 along with a parallel universe's worth of fun. 
Thanks so much for joining me this week, guys. If you want to know more about any of the Kickstarters that you saw here today, or you just want to check out more of my cat, then join me on Fridays at noon at gloryhound.com as we talk about all of the Kickstarters you saw here today, if we would back them or not. And you guys get to join in on the conversation as it is a live show. Other than that, we will see you guys all next week. War games, they're touchy. They deal with death, destruction, you know. Ah, if you're gonna play a war game, might as well play the war game that ends all war games. Armageddon War, platoon level combat in the end war. This is a game designed by Greg Border, published by Flying Pig Games. Yep, you heard me right, Flying Pig. Armageddon War is a big game. You know, as war gamers, we could be funny sometimes. The rule book is 44 pages long. Take it easy. 27 pages are rules, there's big pictures in the rules, and the rest are charts and scenarios. Five factions you can play in this game. ISIL, the Rebels, Israel, United States, and Russia. What's cool about this game is you get to play with some really big tanks like T-90s from Russia, Abrams USA, Merkava's Israel, and also some untested weapons. A hypothetical platoon level game taking place in the year 2028 in the Middle East. Platoon level means that each playing piece, each chit that you have has approximately 25 to 50 men as opposed to a tactical game which has about one to seven men. The game comes with different colored dice offering you different intensity of firepower. Sometimes you might roll two blacks, one red, offering you this much firepower. Sometimes you might roll three greens, one black, offering you a very minimal type of firepower. Armageddon comes with two 22 by 33 inch mounted maps, four sheets of thick one inch die cut counters, full color rule book with 16 scenarios. This is a fun two player game that plays in about one to three hours. It also has a solo module called Alone in the Desert. So if you want to play a war game of meeting complexity in the distant future, Armageddon War Platoon Level Combat in the End War is a game for you. Armageddon War, published by Flying Pig Games. Really, Flying Pig. If you want to know more about war games, please check out my channel, No Enemies Here, and thank you for watching. Hi everyone, Happy New Year! It's Stella from Meeple University. We usually do rules overview, playthrough and vlog on YouTube. Today, I'm going to talk about Teotihuacan, what I like about it, what I don't like about it, coming up. So, Teotihuacan, City of Guts. It is designed by Daniele Tashini, who also designed Sulkin, one of my favorite board games. So it is essentially an action rundle game where you place your weke or your dice around the board. What I really like about the game is that it is highly customizable. The tiles you can just lay to each different location randomly. If you have played Tolkien, you probably recognize some similarities in Teotihuacan. In Tolkien, you have to feed your workers with corns and I feel like in Tolkien it is quite brutal it is pretty hard to get corns while in Teotihuacan it is easier where you collect cocoa you can basically forego your actions by going to an action space and just collect cocoa because you do need a lot of cocos in this game another thing I like about Teotihuacan is that you can build some engines with the technology tiles where it will make your actions a little bit more powerful my least favorite thing about Teotihuacan is the tile lying rotating bit I have a bit of a special issue I have a little bit of problem with tile lying where you have to rotate certain tiles if you have a little bit trouble with that you might struggle a little bit although in this game it's not that overly bad so you can probably get away with it and still enjoying the game another thing that i found a little bit difficult is having to remember a lot of things in your turn such as playing coco moving your dice pip up and also moving the eclipse or round marker each turn but after a few turns after a few games that would not be a problem anymore if you enjoy my segment please consider checking us out on youtube Maple university Thanks for watching and until next week. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? First of all, there's no week in review this week. Uh, we'll do one in a few weeks where we'll wrap up all the videos that we've done so you can keep track of all of them. We'll just put them all in one big week in review video. Uh, there's gonna be several reviews this week. I'm gonna be taking a look at Seventh Guest, the board game. 
not necessarily a kind review. And several others, I already mentioned Sam and Z will be doing a live Q&A. We're also going to be doing some live stuff this week. We're going to be playing the new expansion for Western Legends this coming Thursday. So come back on board for that. And we're going to go back in time 20 years ago and take a look at the games from 1999 and 1998. We're combining the two years. Uh, and then Sam, me, and Z are going to do a back talk, and we're just going to take people's questions. So there's a bunch of that stuff coming out this week. I'm also, if I get all the information, which I think I will, I'll be doing a top 10 best-selling games of 2018. So hopefully you will enjoy all that stuff coming out this week. And of course, our podcast, Mandy and Suzanne, will be putting one out this Tuesday. And you can check out all our other podcasts on Dicetowernetwork.com. All right, let's move on. Howdy folks, welcome to By The Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from The Family Showdown. This week's topic, the definitive top five games of 2018. So I traveled out to the YouTube and I found the top game lists of 2018 from 20 YouTube personalities. And I compiled their list with math magic. And I came up with the definitive list of the top five games of 2018. Coming in at number five is Root from the Makers of Vast. This, again, has the players with very different asymmetrical powers. They're all vying for control of this vast wilderness with cute little animals. Coming in at number four is Rising Sun, the big box game from Eric Lang. It has betrayal, negotiation, and everything in between, all coupled with big, giant, grotesque-looking monsters. Coming in at number three is Underwater Cities. This card game, many are comparing it to Terraforming Mars, but this time, you're under the water. Coming in at number two is the Euroi game of Coimbra. This game, you're rolling dice. You're using those dice to draft cards. You're using those cards to do all sorts of Euroi games, like going up on tracks and getting uh, in-game scoring. Coming in at number one is Chronicles of Crime. This was also the most common game among all the lists I looked at. In Chronicles of Crime, you're working cooperatively with other investigators to solve a crime using to app technology, all kinds of QR codes, even a little bit of virtual reality. So there you have it. There is the definitive top five games of 2018 so far. If you like lists, top 10 lists, all kinds of crazy lists, top 100 lists, you can visit our channel over on The Family Showdown on YouTube. See you next time. Happy breakfast, everybody. Today, I'm going to talk to you about Treasure Island. Now, I'm sure you've heard Tom speak in his review about the thematic elements of the game, and, well, it's certainly all there. And it even, in my opinion, justifies some of the component issues that other people are having with the game. So, the game is a bit like a hidden movement game, but the treasure doesn't move, and that's where Long John Silver has hidden it. His crewmates are kind of working together, but not at the same time to find it. They're going around the map and trying to sort of search different places and getting clues. Now, the things you're using for the searches are these circles and you're going to pen around it and then you say, is it in this position? You're going to get other clues that are like compasses that are this section of the map and this section of the map cannot be where the treasure is. And all of these are, are great. I think they, they look amazing on the board. And actually, they're quite thematic when you think of having the map and someone putting the map on the table and thinking, it's in this area, or it's definitely not over here. It's not 100% accurate. It is a bit rough in terms of you're penning a circle on the main game board and then the, the crew, or even the Long John Silver character trying to remember what he said, the drawing on their little map, their personal ones. And it's not perfect, but it kind of, like the theme of pirates and an old school map trying to find treasure, kind of gives it a pass, the fact that you're using a compass and circles and, and stuff like that. It doesn't need to almost be perfect. You are kind of having to work with the dodgy instruments that pirates might have had to use. So it just kind of all works theme-wise and does somehow the theme gives the game the components a pass for not being as accurate as they could be anyway that's my thoughts on treasure island it's great fun can't wait to get it to the table a little bit more and i'm oliver east signing out hi mike
Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. Happy New Year, everybody. It's a very exciting time of year. Today, I want to talk a little bit about elegance. And that can be a little bit of a vague term, uh, especially in the gaming world. But what got me thinking about it was last night, for the first time, I attempted to play Teotihuacan, and I was playing it in a solo variant. And so I had read the rule book, and I read it a second time, and I felt like, you know what? This isn't that complicated. I feel like I can get going with this pretty well. And by the end of the first round of three, I was thinking to myself, what have I gotten myself into here? My brain was exploding. And I think part of it is because the solo variant in Teotihuacan is one that is quite complicated. There's, there's alternate actions that you take for every one of the actions on the board. And so you have to account for your actions, the alternate actions of the AI bot, some neutral colored dice that are out there, uh, as you'll see in the, in the two player, three player variants, even in the multiplayer game. And so there's just a lot to account for. And so I, th I was thinking to myself, does this make it un inelegant? Uh, is it too much to have to administer what the AI is doing plus what I'm doing? And I don't know if I know the answer to that after one game. I do feel like by the end of the game, I felt much more comfortable and I'm ready to play another one and I'm definitely excited about that. But in something like a worker placement game, the AI usually can be pretty, what I like to call, elegant. You don't have to put a lot of thought behind what the AI is doing. You maybe flip over a card, like with the Automa system, you carry out what the card says, and then you move on to your turn. There's not a lot of thought going on. Maybe it'll be that way in Teotihuacan as well, after I've gotten more used to how the solo bot works. But does that make it inelegant? Should it be something I'm able to pick up right away? Again, I don't know if I have the answer to that, but there's perhaps a bit of a trade-off. If, if something is quote-unquote elegant and simple, maybe it's not really giving you quite the same experience that you would get if you're playing against an opponent. And maybe something like Teotihuacan, which has a lot more involved AI system, uh, perhaps you're getting more of a feeling of playing against an opponent. I don't know. I think it's interesting to think about, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you think that the word elegant uh, goes along with being simple, or is there a little bit more involved to it? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day. Chris Renshaw here, and just like Magic the Gathering last week, this week we're talking about another role-playing game based off of a card game, specifically L5R. Now, I mentioned about a year ago when the beta rulebook became live, and I, I kind of gave a little bit of the background of the story. Well, now all the products have been released, and they all look fantastic. The artwork is splendid throughout all of them and the gameplay I've had a chance to play it a couple times is really engaging. The game is not for everybody, however. This is definitely, if you're looking, if your group is looking for something different, you're wanting more of a narrative story, you've got people willing to buy into the setting and sort of that kind of gameplay where you're not going around just murdering everybody, that you're playing samurai, that are trying to be honorable. If you can get your players to buy into that, then this game might be really awesome. But if you've never played a Fantasy Flight RPG before, you might be thrown off by all the different products. So let's dive into them. The first place to start, if you're curious about any of this at all, is to pick up the beginner's game for L5R. This has a whole bunch of stuff in here. It's got a basic distilled version of the rules in here. It's got maps and tokens for you to lay out if you want to help your players visualize the setting. It's got a set of dice in here because yes, this does use custom dice and it gives you an adventure that'll take you about one to two sessions to run. So really great start off the bat if you don't want to waste a lot of time and money and a good chance to get your players to feel it out and see if they're interested in this kind of game at all. If you're in for the long haul though, then you're definitely going to want to pick up the L5R core rulebook. Not only because it's it's got like the full set of rules in here, but it just looks so freaking sweet. Like this is one of the coolest looking rulebooks that I've I've got on my shelf. But this gives you the full rules. This also shows you how to make characters and that sort of thing. So if you're wanting to run a game or if you're playing in an L5R game, then some at least one person's going to need one of these. But going beyond playing in it, trying it out, you're actually going to run the game. Then yes, you're definitely going to want to pick up the GM's kit for this game. You've got another adventure in here to help you run. And you've got this awesome GM screen, which I like GM screens. But not only does it look pretty, 
but it's also packed with information. I know this is upside down. Right here, you've got a simple condensed version of the rules that is readily available for you to see. Are you interested in playing L5R at all? Let me know down in the comments below, especially if you have any questions about the setting or if there are any questions about what is or isn't included in all the different products. And in the meantime, make sure you follow me on all the different social media platforms and subscribe to the YouTube channel for more great role-playing game videos. And until next time, may all your hits be crits. I'm really excited because finally, after years, the copyrights are not being extended anymore and several works are entering public domain this year. That's a really big deal. Uh, for years, Walt Disney, uh, other people who owned works have fought and extended copyrights long time, longer in time. At this point in time, copyright law is extremely long. And there's even still nuances and stuff that I would not understand. But I do know that they, because of the internet, that's one of the main reasons, these big companies have kind of stopped fighting it. At this point also, if you create a work, the length of copyright laws, that work's going to be around the rest of your life, unless you're some super person who's going to live to be 100 plus years or what have you, and you created the work when you were eight. Um, but this is exciting. We're speaking of board games because this means board games can be made about different things. You can tell when something becomes public domain, whether it's Cthulhu or Sherlock Holmes, because there's a lot of games made about it. But now with each year, there's going to be new works entering uh, public domain. So maybe we'll see some board games made about them. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Like, for example, this is some stuff that I was looking at that is now in the public domain. Some, there's some several short silent films from Buster uh, Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, you know, the one where he's hanging off the clock tower. Uh, some of the R gang uh, things that, you know, they eventually turned into Little Rascals. A couple Felix the Cat cartoons. Some music like the Charleston. I don't know that you can make a board game about that. Or yes, we have no bananas. I don't know why that matters either, but I think that would be a great name for a game. Bambi. The, 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 the book Bambi, that, that's interesting. I mean, Walt Disney already kind of bought the rights to that and made a movie about it, but now you can make something about Bambi. Uh, those, those, some of the novels for Lord Peter Whimsey, some Agatha Christie novels. And this sort of thing, I think, is, is really cool for the hobby. To be able to go back and now have access to this body of work and take them and put our own spins on them and things like that. And I'm really excited to see where this leads. Now, there's no one major, like, this is amazing. You know, that this is now public domain, that I can tell, right? Like, I don't know what here would be, you know, of all the stuff I just mentioned, you know, oh, there's going to be like six games about the Charleston now. I, I doubt it. Uh, but this means in 2020 and 2021, etc., stuff is going to keep coming into play. And that's, that's fascinating to me. That's going to be interesting to see how that works and what companies uh, are going to do and what designers are going to do. It kind of opens up a whole play box of themes and things. So... Um, if you have a theme that you think, uh, some public domain thing that you would love to see from 1923, you know, which is when you can uh, do this thing now, what's that, 96 years? That's crazy. Or 95 years. Uh, either way, uh, put that in the comments. Let us know. I'm very curious about this. I wonder if game designers and publishers are going to look at this or maybe they'll pass it by. But I think it's going to open a door that will eventually allow creativity, not copying, right? And I, like, I was reading about it. There's still some things, like, if you want to do something about Bambi, you can. You just can't do Walt Disney Bambi and have Thumper and all those things. But you can do something from the book Bambi. And again, you can't just copy these things outright, but you can do more with it. So that's kind of cool. And I'm excited to see what the future of this is going to be. And that's what I'm thinking today. I'm, let's keep moving. Welcome to Gaming, Gaming with the Gamer. <laughs> We um, attempted to play a game of Azul. Yes, the, and the keyword is attempted. You want to have a the game was great. I was the, up to. The game play was interesting. This is a fun gateway level game because the rules are very simple for most people to understand. Yes. And the interesting part about this one is we played this one live. Yes. <laughs> about 10 minutes into the, the, the gameplay, we learned that we've been playing uh, this one particular oh, yeah. rule very wrong. <laughs> not, so, not us. 
us. Been no <laughs> In playing, I learned not only are my children not great on Wisconsin time, but um, Dan, our whole marriage has been a sham. He has lied to me about the rules. I didn't want to say anything. I thought it was a little unfair then because you had what Azul was in your mind, and in reality, it wasn't that. So I feel like you were like relearning the game. My life has been a lie. And it's not like I missed a rule in, like, Toilet uh, Imperium or something like that. Like, I missed a rule in Azul. Like, it's supposed to be gateway. It's supposed to be simple. Huh. And I was did making you have fun it. playing it? I did, yeah, yeah. Well, what does it matter? Did you? <laughs> not this time. <laughs> she talked about what she liked about Azul. I mean, what do I like about anything what right now, like Dan? <laughs> yeah. Obviously, the prettiness. Like, hello. It's a really, really it's beautiful. Pretty game. And the sounds when you're reaching the bag, and every time we get to place them on the little circles, we say it's like, oh, you get to do the honor of it because it is fun. It's mm-hmm. they feel good. Yeah. yeah, we love it. Have we never played with the the gray side. Have you played with the gray side? I have not. I really want to try it. We should try it right now. <laughs> I'm so glad we got to come to Wisconsin. Oh my gosh, it's so cold here. It's freezing. Take it's me back freezing. to California. Yeah. We're stronger people. I feel like we've bonded. Yes, I agree. We, we have, have been to war. Board games literally. and babies. Board like, games and babies. If you want to feel better about your life, go watch our go live, watch stream. live stream. And it was uh, something. Of- it was something. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. One of my favorite games by master designer Rudiger Dorn has an app by Akram Digital. Let's take a look at how this Kennerspiel winner does in digital form. In Istanbul, players control a team comprised of a merchant and assistants. Tiles represent different market booths that you can visit to collect and trade goods, with the ultimate goal of being the first to collect a certain number of rubies. So it's essentially a race game. As you move your merchant throughout the market, to take an action, you have to deposit an assistant on the tile, where they stay until you go back later or take a recall action. Planning the merchant's path for maximum efficiency while the rewards on the tile shift because players are using them, well, that takes strategic and tactical savvy. I think the Istanbul app is Akram Digital's best work to date. The app is full of features, including an interactive tutorial that does a good job of teaching the game, and the rules are chaptered in a great way, making them a useful reference should you need it. The app includes multiple AIs and a rich online system that allows for asynchronous or real-time play, private games, and it even accounts for people who may drop accidentally or on purpose, filling them in with an AI. Even better, the game offers gameplay options like the optional neutral assistance and a variety of board layouts. And even better than that, the Istanbul app has an undo feature, a rarity in board game apps. Istanbul is a game that has a lot of different things going on, and the app takes that into account too, with a convenient info button on almost every screen, allowing you to check on what a tile or card can do. But even with that, I suggest that Istanbul plays best on a tablet. While it is playable on a smaller phone screen, especially if you're familiar with the tiles and the art, everything is pretty small and it may be hard for you to see. But really, I have very few complaints about the Istanbul app. It leverages the original board game art and is quite easy to jump into if you're familiar with the analog game, and it provides a compelling and enjoyable app gaming experience. I really hope Akram releases the expansions for Istanbul in the future because expanding this gameplay is only a good thing. Istanbul won the Kennerspiel Award for good reason, and the Istanbul app does the gameplay proud. Give it a try. Hello everyone, my name is Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Apply Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Crusaders, Thy Will Be Done. So in this game, you're traveling across a map and you're building different buildings along with defeating enemies. However, the most interesting part of the game is that rondelle. So let me show you a little bit about it and why I really like it. Players will be moving their knights all across Europe while they're conquering different enemies along with building different buildings from their own player board onto the map. Each player can also start off with a knight, which will give them a special perk or bonus throughout the game. On a player's turn, you could do one of two actions. The first action is to resolve an action. You could take an action by picking a tile that's on this rondelle. For example, if you want to travel, then you pick this tile, which has two action markers, 
and it will let you travel twice on the map. When you're done with the action, then you'll take the tokens off of that and you'll distribute them going in a clockwise fashion. Another action a player can take is to upgrade one of their wedges or tiles. They simply just flip it over. An upgraded tile will not only have one action to take from, but can have two potential actions to take from. Besides traveling, a player can also muster, in which they'll flip over their troop tile and become more powerful during a crusade. Players will also be able to build, in which they'll be able to build any of these buildings like a castle, a church, a farmhouse, or even a bank. When you build, you simply take one of the buildings off of your player board, which will give you a bonus, and then you'll place it on the map. Another action you could take is just to collect influence, which are points. And the final type of action is to crusade, which will defeat enemies on the map. Whenever a player collects the last influence, then the game will be over. Whoever collects the most points wins. So as you can see, there's a lot going on in this game. You're traveling across the map, and you're trying to defeat all these enemies while gaining all these bonuses, and actually building an engine too. What I find most interesting is the rondelle because you're taking these different actions on these tiles, but you're also distributing these markers along the way. You're doing it in a Moncala type of fashion, and that's why I like Crusaders I Will Be Done. Well, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye! It's Christina from Girls Game Show. Happy New Year's! I love New Year's resolutions. And I've been looking online and seeing all of your board game resolutions. It seems like a lot of people have the goal of spending less money on games in 2019, which is a noble resolution. We all know that this hobby can get pretty expensive. So I figured that you'll be doing that by playing more of the games that you already own or going to more game nights. Or maybe you'll do something that I am a big fan of, which is borrowing games from your friends. Borrowing games is excellent, but it leads us to another board game etiquette question. How long is it okay to keep a borrowed game for? Of course, that answer is going to be different every time based on who you borrow the game from and what game is it and is it important to them. With all of that in mind, I do have three tips on how to make sure that borrowing games doesn't end friendships for you. Tip number one, first and foremost, and most importantly, communicate. So this game right here, oh, I love this game so much. It's one of my favorites. I talk about it all the time. But I have borrowed this game from my friend John for two years. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, John. I swear I'm not a terrible person. He lives far away, we don't see each other very often, and I'm afraid to mail it because this is really expensive online to replace. I have made sure to communicate with him and tell him that I still have his game, that it has all the pieces, that I'm excited to see him again. Communicating, number one. Tip number two, if you're planning on borrowing a game that is special to somebody or it's new, it's really lovely if you lend them a game of yours that is special to you. So the Brothers Murph lent me Villainous, which was pretty, fairly new at the time when they lent it to me. So in good faith, I lent them my copy of Tortuga 1667, which is another one of my favorite games. And I like that practice of exchanging games anyways, because it shows people that you're not taking advantage of their kindness. Tip number three, when you plan on returning the game, call up that friend and organize a little mini game night because the chances are that if they lent you that game, they also want to talk about it with you. I borrowed Newton from my friend Jack. Actually, we have an episode on Girls Game Shelf with Newton. And I plan on having a game night with her and my friend Ben and playing Newton, among other things, when I return it to her. So those are my three tips. Have a wonderful start to your new year and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Hello, my name's Dan. And this is Cora, and we're here today to talk to you about board games for young children. And today we're going to talk to you about this game. Yeah. What is it, Cora? Yummy Monsters. Yummy Monsters. Yummy Monsters is a dexterity game where the players are waiters at a monster restaurant, trying to feed their customers by throwing food through their open mouths. 
Each monster, however, have got a unique set of quirks surrounding how they like to be fed. For example, with a player's less dominant hand, or with one of the player's eyes closed, or, or whatever. And you can see what quirk each monster has by the tiles that are kind of clipped to the top of the monster's head. And, well, that's about it, really. It's not the most complicated game in the world, but it is quite fun. So, Cora, what do you think about Yummy Monsters? I how um, it does stuff like kneel down, close one eye. Well, you have to do, do it in your palm. You have to throw in different ways. Yeah. I and mean, I like the way that do it with your left hand. Do it left like... hand. Tiptoes is one of the ones we played in another game, wasn't it? Uh, both <laughs> eyes closed. All sorts of stuff. And I like the way that you change what you have to do by turning the box round. I think that's quite quite a clever thing. You go from one monster, you turn it around to the next monster, and there's a different thing. That's right, yeah. And I like these things as well. So these are little, you probably saw us wearing on the thing, these are little kind of things you put on your hands to, to make throwing it a little bit more, more Harder. different. Hard, yeah. And also... Because when you're doing your new tiptoes, it, it seems kind of easy. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Also, you get these masks. Uh, but to, to, I uh, don't, we don't do that. We don't do the masks, because Cora, Cora doesn't like wearing them and, I don't and for want me to do it. um too 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 small my head is too big <laughs> you have a big head <laughs> big head <laughs> so we give uh yummy monsters two monster thumbs up Where's your monster thumbs <laughs> <laughs> As always, I really thank my contributors for doing an amazing, fantastic, wonderful, terrific job. I thank each and every one of you for coming each week and watching our show. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you next time. Until then, though, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.